So Rahul, we are live on YouTube. Uh, we'll just begin in a minute. Sure. Ready, Rahul? Shall we begin? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, welcome, everyone, to the Institute Colloquium of IMSC. Uh, Rahul Siddharthan will uh, uh, deliver the lecture on uh, the 2020 novels and uh, history of gene editing. Uh, just a request, everyone, could you please just uh, mute your uh, individual mics so that there is no interference uh, sound in them? Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi everyone. Um, give me a moment to share my screen. Um, it's visible to everyone, I guess. Uh, so if you have any questions in the middle, I realize a lot of people here who are not biologists and I try to... Um, so the plan of the talk is going to be uh, initially explain some very basic biology. What is DNA? Why would we want to edit it? And how do we edit it? And then I'll talk about various previous techniques that have been used and are actually still used before getting on to actually what CRISPR is. And that's a... Yes, um, yes um, Can I request yes, everyone to mute the mics? And uh, if you have any questions, you can type them on the chat box and Vishwanath will alert me. Or oh, if that doesn't work, you can unmute and ask me right then. Um, if anything is unclear or if anything is wrong. Uh, there are also people in this audience who are much more expert than I am. So um, this is not an expert talk. This is not my field. Um, okay, so with that said, uh, very basic stuff. What is DNA? It is the um, molecule that carries um, the genetic information about us. So it carries all the information in the sense that is required um, to produce pro uh, the at the ba most basic level it encodes for proteins um, and uh, uh, initially let's just look at the structure of DNA it is this famous double helix where you have a backbone that's made of uh, uh, a sugar called deoxyribose and a phosphate group and to and it's a polymer backbone um, so there are two of them and uh, to the backbone are attached these things which are called nucleotides and there are four of them in dna a for adenine t for thymine uh, c for cytosine and g for guamine and uh, a and t pair with each other c and g pair with each other and that's um, the basic structure of the dna molecule uh, you have roughly um, three billion base pairs worth of dna uh, we often talk about base pairs because whenever you see one base, you also see another base on the other strand. Um, so you measure the length of DNA in base pairs. So humans have 23 chromosomes, uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes. Simpler organisms have fewer or in some cases more. Um, prokaryotes, uh, 
uh, which is basically bacteria and archaea, which we will talk about in a little bit, are much simpler organisms. Uh, they are unicellular and they don't have a nucleus as such. They have DNA, which is a single circular chromosome that's kind of floating around in the cell. Um, and that's typically a few million base pairs long as opposed to three billion here. So DNA um, codes for, it has regions of DNA that code for genes. We won't get into exactly how that works here, uh, but you all know that um, that's basically something of importance both in basic biology and in medicine. A um, couple of basic concepts that are important and I'll mention. Uh, I mentioned that it's double-stranded uh, and the two strands uh, run in opposite directions. So um, you can think of it as having a sort of, um, this is the double-stranded DNA and this one is unwound. So you can think of it as running along a certain polarity and the other strand runs backwards. Um, so uh, because of chemistry reasons, this, this end of the strand is called the pi prime end. And this is called the three prime end because there's a five prime phosphate group at the three prime hydroxyl group here. The other strand goes the other way around. So it's five prime here and three prime here. And conventionally, we humans read DNA from five prime to three prime uh, because that's also how uh, cellular machinery, in particular the RNA polymerase, reads it, um, the thing that turns DNA into RNA. Um, so there is another protein, uh, there's another molecule similar to DNA called RNA. Um, which uh, has a different sugar phosphate backbone. It is ribose instead of deoxyribose. And it has three of these four nucleotides instead of T, it has U, which is uracil. And it is typically single-stranded. And uh, because it is single-stranded, it uh, can kind of base pair, but not as rigorously. So it can form complicated structures uh, like when, when where nucleotides can kind of link with each other. Um, so, uh, you typically, uh, when you download a DNA sequence from NCBI or whatever database, you get it as a string. It's a sequence of letters. And that sequence of letters might be uh, like the top row here, A, C, T, G, G. Which is simply the letters that are on top here. Um, you could equally well think of it as the string on the other strand. Once you know one of them, you know the other. So the other strand would be read as C-A-A-T-T-G-C-C-A-G-T. Um, so these two sequences This is just the second strand read from the five prime to the three prime end. Um, one says that this is the reverse complement of this. And I'll be talking about palindromes later. In ordinary English, a palindrome is a word like uh, a level or Malayalam that reads the same forwards or backwards. But in DNA, a palindrome is a sequence that is its own reverse complement. So if you read it backwards, you have to read it on the other strand. So this is an example of a palindrome. If you were to make the base pairs of this, you'll get T, T, G, C, 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 A, A. And then if you read it backwards, it's the same as that. Um, this has a, some consequences for DNA, but more especially RNA structure, um, which we won't really get into, but I'm just mentioning it because of terminology that will come up. Um, so um, that's so much about DNA and it contains genes and genes contain information about proteins. DNA contains other kinds of information also like how the genes are turned on and off, um, regulatory information. It contains information that might be relevant to the structure of the uh, chromatin. And it contains a lot of stuff that we don't fully understand what it does like repetitive sequences and so on. But for the parts that uh, we understand, we also know how DNA replicates. Um, and that's also interesting, so I'll just mention it. Um, because it is such a um, rigidly base paired template, you essentially never have a mismatch. G always pairs with C, A always pairs with T. Um, you can use, you can replicate DNA by unwinding it and using each strand as a template to synthesize a new strand of DNA. And this is basically what happens. And there's a machine called a polymerase, 
that does this replication. Um, so it, as you unspool it, the polymerase slides along it and lays down a base pair that corresponds to the one that uh, it lays on a base corresponds to the one that it sees on the other strand very faithfully. Now, um, as some of you might ask, what happens on the other strand? Because I just mentioned that the two strands actually have a polarity. So supposing this blue strand goes from five prime to three prime, um, then the other strand goes in the other direction. Now, uh, it was uh, decades ago a question uh, are there two kinds of DNA polymerase, one of which goes from five prime to three prime and the other goes from three prime to five prime? And it turns out, uh, no, there is only one kind of DNA polymerase. So for this strand, which is called sometimes a lagging strand, it actually lays down pieces of DNA piecewise as and when it gets access. So it lays down a stretch of DNA like that. Then as it unwinds further, it lays down a stretch like that. And then as this unwinds further, it laid on such like that. So this strand is laid more or less continuously. This strand is laid in little pieces. These are called Okazaki fragments. And uh, then there are um, ligases that sort of finish the job. And one consequence of this is that you do tend to get a few more errors on this strand compared to this strand. So DNA can accumulate changes in replication it can accumulate changes due to environmental mutagens, whether it's cosmic rays or chemicals in your environment and so on. It cannot uh, accumulate other kinds of um, changes which are not single point mutations. For example, uh, little pieces of DNA can get repeated or they can get left out during the process of replication because the polymerase slips and um, skips apart. Um, and these things slowly accumulate over um, millennia and they are important because that is how life becomes more diverse. If there were no errors at all, we'd all be the original single-celled organism. Um, but it also is a problem because it can cause malfunctioning of the cells. It can cause various kinds of diseases. So understanding how DNA mutates and also understanding how we can ourselves make changes to DNA is one of the central um, goals of uh, molecular biology and uh, what they call genome engineering. Okay, so how do you edit DNA? This is going to be the subject of this talk. Um, you can think of editing a document in a word processor. Um, you open a document and then you can type in letters and you have functions like cut and paste and so on. Um, so uh, biologists have, uh, biochemists have uh, pretty sophisticated ways to synthesize any DNA sequence that you like in the lab. And what you really want to do is, <clears throat> the goal is in a living cell, you have a genome, which might be a few million or a few billion base pairs long. In that genome, you have a gene, which does something. And maybe you're an expert biologist and you want to see what happens when you knock out that gene. Or maybe you're a clinician and this is a defective uh, gene that causes sickle cell anemia and you want to make a mutation that fixes that. Um, either way, you want to edit the genome in a living organism, and that's kind of been um, the goal. How would you do that? Um, so uh, one characteristic of DNA, uh, because it's so tightly base paired, uh, it also doesn't like to be broken. So as I mentioned, in a prokaryote, uh, DNA is arranged as a circular chromosome. It doesn't have any loose ends. In the eukaryote, it is arranged into chromosomes, but the ends of the chromosomes are very tightly packaged with protein, uh, histones, and they're called telomeres. So the end is not really exposed. Now, in the middle of DNA, if you make a break, it really wants to heal that break as soon as possible. And there are cellular machinery that help it to heal that break. So that is what we exploit. So this slide tells you kind of how that happens. Um, so in biology, anything that ends in A's is a protein, an enzyme that does something. So a nuclease is basically something that breaks uh, DNA. Um, and the ribonuclease is something that breaks RNA. We'll come to that also. So um, there are a lot of these nucleases in nature in various organisms. And uh, most of this has been exploiting a nuclease to make a break. 
in a place, in a part of DNA that you care about. And uh, what you might want to do, for example, is uh, just knock out that DNA. So uh, these uh, abbreviations stand for non-homologous end joining. Um, what that means is that when you break this, this piece really has nothing to do with this piece. So there is no sequence similarity as such. So uh, it might happen that these two just rejoin somehow, but in the process of rejoining, it loses something or it mutates something because there is no template as such. It might stay the same or it might kind of get knocked out. And if you make a mutation in the middle of a gene like this, typically the gene gets inactivated um, because the gene is read three letters at a time. And if you knock out a single letter or two letters or four letters, then um, you're in a different frame to read the DNA and uh, the entire gene becomes, I mean, half the gene becomes a nonsense. So uh, this is one way to knock out a gene by simply breaking it in the middle and letting it rejoin imperfectly. Um, you could also insert a gene by inserting, as I said, you can actually engineer any DNA sequence you like. And there are these circular DNA loops called plasmids, which are very common in uh, prokaryotes. Um, you can insert the DNA into the cell and then you can snip it using typically the same endonucleus. Uh, so uh, we'll come to how this nucleus actually knows where to snip. Um, but um, let's say you know exactly where to snip and then this actually has the same sequence so it snips at the same place. So now you've got a snip sequence that kind of matches these two and uh, it gets inserted in there. It could still have errors because it's non-homologous, but uh, it could uh, get inserted in between and then you've got a gene insertion. Of course, if you're unlucky, it might not happen. These two might get fused together and this, this one might get degraded. So what typically they do is they have a collection of cells where they're trying to do this and you might need to filter out the ones where it didn't work and keep the ones that where it worked. Um, this slide shows what's called homologous recombination, which is typically more reliable. Um, homologous means that the strands kind of match. So if you have a single stranded DNA, it's really unhappy and it wants to, and if you have two strands of DNA that are single stranded and complementary, they tend to join together extremely efficiently um, because they are happy to be base paired. So what you do here is um, you have double stranded DNA, but your uh, donor DNA has some kind of overlap with the original DNA. So you make the cut as before, but in fact, this part of the donor DNA matches this part of the original DNA and this part matches this part. And because uh, you have made a cut, these strands are no longer so stable, they can peel apart and then they can actually hybridize with this, meaning the, the top strand here can kind of join up with the bottom strand here and form a new molecule. Similarly, the top strand here can join up with the bottom strand here. And so what ends up happening is that this uh, gene, as in this case, gets inserted here, but this tends to be a more reliable process. So these are two ways DNA can be modified after a break occurs uh, by non-homologous end joining or by homologous recombination. The real question is, um, how do you tell the endonucleus where to cut? And that has been, uh, well, so there have been ways to do it since the 90s, but the more uh, specific ways required uh, some biological discoveries, and I'll mention two of them. Um, what you really need is an object that not just cuts DNA, which is a nucleus, but also something that recognizes a sequence pattern in DNA so that it knows where to go and cuts it there. And there are proteins that do that. Uh, there are DNA binding proteins that recognize sequence patterns, uh, but typically they're not so specific and also the patterns they recognize are kind of all over the genome. So you want to have a protein that recognizes a specific pattern that occurs in only one place in the genome and then go there and cut it. And that's a much harder task. Um, one 
way to do it is uh, it was uh, this is from an article by Dana Carroll, who's one of the pioneers of this technique, and uh, it's called a zinc finger nucleus. So a zinc finger is a protein structure that uh, uh, it's called a finger because it's a sort of something that extrudes from the main protein like that. And a lot of transcription factors, for example, have these zinc finger domains. And typically these uh, parts of the protein contact the DNA three base pairs at a time. So that's kind of what they've shown in this cartoon. Each of these boxes is meant to be a zinc finger, but if you like, you can imagine it's coming out from some protein that's you know, somewhere else. And it's touching the DNA three base pairs at a time. It's a reasonably specific contact. And uh, so um, what you need to do is uh, you want to find a particular part of the genome to cut. Then you need to look at the neighboring parts of the genome. This is where you want to cut. So what is the sequence here? What is the sequence here? And you need to find a set of zinc fingers that like to bind to the sequence. And that's kind of a hard problem, but a doable problem. So what it means is for a particular task, supposing you're targeting a particular gene, you need to identify some sequence in that neighborhood of a gene that would be a good target for zinc fingers. So they have catalogs of what zinc fingers might like to bind to. You need to engineer a zinc finger nucleus that you actually need to engineer two of them. There's one that binds here and there's one that binds here. And uh, you need to, uh, engineer it so that, uh, so, so you have a zinc finger protein that binds. And to that, you add a nucleus domain that is able to cleave the DNA while the zinc finger is still bound there. So that's what happens. And then you can do as before, you can either do non-homologous enjoining or you can add donor DNA and um, you can insert a gene. Um, so this was actually, <coughs> big technology when it came out in the, I guess, early 2000s. And even more specific technology that caused a lot of excitement a little later is something called TALENS with an E. What that stands for is transcriptional activator-like effectors nucleases. So this part of it, the tail, is a protein complex that was discovered in Xanthomonas, which is a plant pathogen. Um, it is the thing that sometimes makes a kind of gooey mess around infected plants. And if you ever seen an ingredient called xanthan gum in various additives, that's basically extracted from that bacteria. But this particular tail also came from that. It um, basically is a collection of um, sort of amino acid groups of 30 amino acids each. Each of these specifically recognizes one nucleotide. So in that way, it is quite a bit better than uh, the uh, zinc finger, which recognizes three at a time, and you have to really fine tune it. Here, you are able to um, get it to recognize one at a time. So it is a lot more specific. But um, so the issue with the zinc finger thing was that uh, it's, uh, there are two things. You need to bind well to the region you're interested in, and you want to minimize binding to other parts of the genome because you don't want to be randomly cutting up DNA where uh, you know you don't want any effect. You want to go to one specific place and cut it there. That's the holy grail. Um, this comes a little closer to that, but this also is hugely complicated to engineer. So again, for each uh, um, region that you are interested in modifying, you need to uh, create this complicated mess of proteins that constitute these, uh, you know, tail um, kind of protein and add a nucleus to it and then, uh, you know, send it in and see if it cuts. So if you have, uh, it's good for uh, specific gene therapies when you know when you, this is the gene you want to target and you want to mass produce something, then it works. But if you are an experimental biologist and you want to be playing around messing with different genes, you need to do this every time you want to uh, target a you know, particular region of DNA, it becomes impractical and expensive. Right, but uh, 
Nevertheless, these technologies, ZFM Stalins, and there's something called a mega nucleus, which is from bacteria again. It is a nucleus that binds to DNA and recognizes large sections. But again, engineering it to recognize what you want is a challenge. But these were nature's method of the year in 2011. It was a uh, that was a time when gene editing was becoming big. Um, and the very next year, uh, this happened. <clears throat> this was a paper from non Charpentier's groups in 2012 in science, in August 2012. Um, the title is a programmable dual RNA guided DNA internucleus. And they say uh, in the abstract, our study reveals a family of internucleases that use dual RNAs for site specific DNA cleavage, highlights the potential to exploit the system for RNA programmable genome editing. What they're saying is it's very hard to design a protein that binds to exactly the DNA you want. But you can design an RNA that binds to the DNA you want because it's just base complementarity. Um, so that part is easy to do. And if you can do that, you can design an RNA for any target sequence you like that really changes the game. So they demonstrated that they could do this sort of in vivo. Sorry. Um, I have some issue with this slide. Um, can you guys see my screen or I have, I seem to have blanked. So it's blank. Yeah. I'm not sure what happened there. Am I still online? Okay, I'm sorry, I uh, give me a moment and I'll try to yeah. relaunch. I'm not sure what happened there. Am I back? Yeah, we can see your presentation. That I lost the slide. Okay, here, I, here we are. Okay, so um, yeah, so I was here and 
Um, so the interesting thing is the very next month came another paper talking about the same thing. And I'll talk about the timeline of this shortly. This is from a much less well-known group in Lithuania and uh, with some collaborators and so on. But uh, Virginia Sixness had been working on CRISPR-Cas9 for a while too. And they too say more or less the same thing, that their findings pave the way for engineering universal programmable RNA-guided DNA into nucleases. Okay, so um, the rest of the talk is going to be about the timeline of where it all started and where it ended up at this point in 2012 and uh, what uh, happened after that to some extent. So um, this is a good article up to a point overviewing the history of CRISPR by Eric Lander. I say up to a point because um, as I'll mention later, the Broad Institute where he works is uh, um, the workplace of uh, he's the director of Broad Institute. It's a workplace of uh, one of the other pioneers of CRISPR, and there's been kind of a credit dispute. So, at roughly the year 2012, there are you know various people have alleged that he has not given a fair picture of what happened. But anyway, so it's a good overview of the early history, and I've sort of used it to outline some of my talk. But he starts in 1989 or so. I'll start in 1987. Um, which is this paper, which doesn't seem to have anything to do with CRISPR. It is a gene that um, is responsible for alkaline phosphatase isozyme conversion in E. coli. And uh, the only notable thing about this paper, which was noted only years later, is um, this figure, figure five. They find these sequences in the three prime end flanking region of IAP, that means downstream of the gene. Um, they find uh, 29 highly conserved nucleotides, which is uh, show, which basically this set, um, with uh, a very well conserved spacer sequence of uh, I'm 30 something nucleotides. So it's very regular. And these nucleotides, if you look closely, they are uh, they're not symmetric, but they are kind of symmetric. Uh, so if you look at here, this is CCCC, and then there's a GGGG here, and then there's a T here and A here. So it's kind of close to palindromic, but not, real, not really palindromic, but they didn't really comment about that. They just commented over the conservation. And that was it in 1987. 1989, there's a young uh, PhD student at that time uh, called Francisco Mojica. He was uh, at the University of Alicante in Southern Spain. And uh, I think he himself came from a town nearby there. So he joined the university nearest to him. And his advisor was working on this salt tolerant archaea called Halophyrax mediterranei. So, uh, just a bit of background, you might know that I mentioned prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Now within prokaryotes, there are two uh, classes, one are bacteria and one are archaea. Until about 30, 40 years ago, they were regarded as two branches of bacteria. So the old books say archaea bacteria and eubacteria, but the modern views that archaea are actually a different branch of life altogether. But they share a lot of uh, common things with uh, eubacteria. So, at this time, they were looking at how salt constant, so these are salt resistant, and uh, the advisor was looking at resist restriction enzymes in this uh, object, which are enzymes that cut the genome, and how that is affected by salt, salt concentration. And so this guy, Mohika, was looking at the fragments that come out of this cutting, and he found multiple repeats of an almost palindromic 30 base pair sequence with 36 base pair spacer in fragment. So, you mentioned in biology, when you see something that is highly conserved, whether it is within the organism or um, it is across species, it usually means something. Because either you have a sequence that codes for a protein or it codes for uh, an RNA molecule or something else. But if it is conserved, it means it has some function. Otherwise, it will just mutate away. So these sequences are not a part of a coding region. They are away from a gene, but they're repeated and uh, there must be some reason for it there. So this was 1989, remember, and he worked on it till 93, I think is when they published it. 
um, there was not that much database of sequences out there. Um, today, when you see a new sequence, the first thing you do is run BLAST on NCBI. But uh, if you, I'm not even sure whether NCBI was there, BLAST was not there at that time. And he couldn't find a match with any known sequence. Okay, so um, this was from his paper. And uh, these overlines are the repeated sequence that he has uh, found in multiple places here. And uh, that was about it. Then he went for a postdoc in London. And then uh, he continued his work as a young faculty member in Alicante. And uh, he found the similar repeats in various archaea, and not just in the one that he was looking at. And he found the Sishino paper in Eubacteria, which sees the same thing. So it is not the same sequence, but it is a very similar repeat pattern. So he figured that there's some significant function of these repeats. It's there both in archaea and in new bacteria. And though it's not the same sequence, it's a sort of same pattern. There must be some reason for it. And uh, at the University of Alicante, he didn't have much experimental funding. So he mostly did bioinformatic work. And he named these sequences short, regularly spaced repeats. Um, and he had found in 20 different microbes by the year 2000. And in 2002, these people, Johnson et al, uh, renamed it in their paper to clustered regularly interspaced palindromic repeats, uh, or CRISPR for short. And in their acknowledgments, they acknowledge useful discussions with Mohika, including on the name. It sounds like he suggested this name change to them. And uh, so that is the name that has stuck since then. But at this point, it is a bunch of repeats in prokaryotes and nobody really knows what it does. Okay, so um, through the 2000s, people found more and more examples in more and more microbes. And uh, people also found the same paper by Johnson in 2002 found a bunch of genes nearby, which it turned out are also kind of conserved across most microbes. They're always near this CRISPR locus and they were called CAS for CRISPR associated. And uh, by today, um, these various kinds of CRISPR CAS systems are classified into two classes and five types that I won't go into. The one that is useful for genome editing that we'll talk about comes from class two, but um, all of class one and class two and all these types are interesting topics of research for what are they doing in these organisms. Okay, so in 2003, again, Mohika had another thought. So I mentioned that you see something is repeated, it must have a function. But uh, they couldn't figure out the function. Then he thought, what about the spaces? Is, is there something unusual about them? He had already looked at them earlier, but there was not much sequence data. But at this time, you know, BLAST had been invented and NCBI's database had started filling up with new sequences. So he took his word processor and took out the text of each spacer one by one and ran it on NCBI BLAST against the NCBI database. And bingo, he found a match from an equalized state against a P1 phage. A phage is a virus that infects bacteria. And uh, so he found that one of the spaces from an E. coli strain that he had matched a sequence from a P1 phage. And this particular strain was known to be resistant to that P1 infection. And he found, uh, I think, uh, 20 or 30 more examples by the end of the week. He looked at like 80 plus examples, and I think half or two thirds of them had um, some match to a phage somewhere. So there he had a very um, solid hypothesis to go with that this is something to do with phage infection. And he, he knew that the strain that he was looking at is resistant. So somehow maybe this is conferring resistance to infection by phages. So we humans have an immune system that's pretty complicated. It uh, consists of these... Uh, uh, lymphocytes, T cells, B cells, all these things. And we have an adaptive immune system where um, when you uh, get infected for the first time, you produce antibodies. Uh, you have a way to um, uh, produce a variety of antibodies. And then the one, if one of them works against your antigen, then you have a system where more of those are produced. But you also have memory cells, T cells and B cells that remember the infection you had and can ramp up production of the same antibodies much later. Um, so 
obviously in a single cellular bacteria, there is no space for any of that machinery. But the hypothesis was that in the DNA itself, there is some kind of adaptive immune system going on where it modifies its own DNA to take, uh, to give some immune action against a phage. So that was the hypothesis then. And uh, he submitted it to Nature. It was rejected. He submitted to PNAS, Molecular Microbiology, NAR. Uh, it was rejected, all of them without review. The editor said it's not very interesting. Um, finally, sent it to a Journal of Molecular Revolution, who took 12 months to review and uh, revise before he finally published in February 2005. So um, this is, a, again, a story that, I repeat, uh, the big journals really didn't uh, understand the importance of this work. Um, interestingly, a similar story was happening in the French Ministry of Defense on something completely unrelated. So um, you might know that uh, for DNA fingerprinting in humans, uh, similar repeat sequences are used. Uh, these are called microsatellites and they're actually much shorter repeats, but they're a variable length and you use a collection of them because two individuals are likely to have different lengths of those repeats. And if you uh, I, if you look at some collection of such microsatellite loci, the, the chances of two individuals having exactly the same length in all of them is really tiny. So well, that's the basic idea in DNA fingerprinting and forensics. These guys were doing the same thing for pathogen forensics, and they were using these repeats for that purpose. They had 61 samples of the plague uh, organism, uh, Vipestis, from Vietnam, and they found that uh, all of these, so there are other tandem repeats apart from CRISPR, but they found that all the other tandem repeats are identical across the 61 samples, but the CRISPR locus had acquired a new spacer at the front end, and these new spacers corresponded to a prophage that is in the wife pestis genome. So this is like a, um, maybe like a retrotransposal, if you like. It is a part of a um, viral genome that has got embedded into the bacterial genome. So the hypothesis, is it a remnant of a past infection? And uh, they too got rejected by um, all these journals. They finally got published in March 2005, a month after um, Mohika published his work. So now you had two pieces of work suggesting that this whole CRISPR-Cas system might somehow be related to viral resistance in bacteria, phage resistance in bacteria. Right, so going on, um, these guys, Van der Roost et al. in 2008, um, characterized a five protein complex in the E. coli CRISPR system, which they called Cascade. This is um, what we call type one CRISPR these days. And uh, the entire complex, I think, is required for the um, what they found. It shows that Cascade. So um, the CRISPR locus is transcribed into an RNA molecule. That means the DNA is used as a template for an RNA. And uh, uh, that is one long sequence, which again contains those repeats as well as those spaces. So what they showed is that, so you have a DNA molecule. And from this, you get an RNA molecule. And this RNA molecule has a repeat spacer, repeat spacer, repeat spacer, and so on. What they found was that this cascade complex breaks up this RNA molecule into um, short 61 nucleotide RNAs, where each of these, what they call CR RNAs or CRISPR RNAs, each of these consists of the last eight base pairs of the repeat, and then the spacer, the complete spacer, and then the first eight base of the next guy. So um, this section is lost, this is taken, this is lost, and then, so basically, um, you have a bunch of RNA molecules that are processed from the transcript that basically contain the spacer plus eight base pairs on each side, which come from the repeat regions. And uh, there are uh, mechanisms of how it might happen. By the So this is the role of the repeat, that it causes a certain folding of RNA that enables this cascade complex to be able to do this. Uh, that is why that repeat needs to be so well conserved. Um, and finally, they created an artificial CRISPR array, basically changing the spacers using 
a sequence from the lambda phage which infects E. coli. So they basically took the CRISPR array uh, from the usual E. coli system, uh, kept the repeats, changed the spacers to target this phase, and then they found that the resulting E. coli is immune to this guide. So they were the first to demonstrate that, yes, this does uh, cause confer immunity against phages. They also hypothesized that the target of CRISPR is DNA. It, uh, CRISPR could be working in uh, two ways. Uh, so, I mean, you, you have processed an RNA molecule, but when you go to the phage molecule, is it targeting uh, the DNA itself or the RNA transcript? How does it work? Um, so these guys, Marafini and Sondheimer, answered that question definitively. Uh, they looked at CRISPR in Staphylococcus epidermis, so uh, human pathogen, and uh, they showed that uh, there was a strain that had a CRISPR spaces matching a uh, Nikase gene in an antibiotic resistant Staph aureus plasmid. And uh, a plasmid, as I said, is a kind of circular loop that tends to float around in bacteria apart from the main chromosome. And he found that these Staph aureus plasmids cannot be transferred to S. epidermis, they get destroyed. And the hypothesis was that it is this CRISPR that is attacking them. So what they did was insert a self-splicing intron into this gene. So an intron is a part of a gene. Um, a gene, as I said, codes for a protein. It's on the DNA. But very often you, so the gene itself is transcribed into an RNA molecule. But there are often parts of the gene that are not coding. And these are called introns. And these are spliced out uh, of the RNA molecule after it is transcribed. So this part is removed and only this part is kept. So their logic was if CRISPR targets the RNA, then it must be, <clears throat> it, it would not care about this intron because the intron is gone. But if it targets the DNA, then of course the intron will destroy its activity. And they found that the intron does destroy the activity of CRISPR. And they also predicted that CRISPR could be used for genome editing using, uh, so what you have now is something that cleaves DNA and does so by recognizing some specific sequence. So if you can modify that sequence, you could perhaps cleave any DNA. They predicted that. They even filed a patent application, but they did not have enough detail at that time and it lapsed. Um, so that was 2008. So there were various other things that happened around 2005 to 2012. So uh, a Russian guy Bolotin found that Cas9 has two nucleus domains. And uh, this is uh, in the, I think it's in group two, uh, but it's one of the Cas proteins. Um, so he found that this is essential for phase resistance. If you remove it, then the phase resistance goes away. And it's a good hypothesis that because it has two nucleus domains, it is the molecule that is involved in cutting. Then the Mono labs from, uh, identified something called a protospacer adjacent motif, which is called PAM. You'll see it in figures later. And they showed that Cas9 cuts DNA exactly three base pairs upstream of this motif. So it somehow recognizes the sequence and goes and cuts DNA there. Then uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and uh, Jörg Vogel uh, found that uh, a kind of molecule called a trans-activating CRISPR RNA, which is something people had not seen before. Um, it was a small RNA that's transcribed from some locus adjacent to the CRISPR locus in uh, staph pyogenes. And uh, they found that its uh, sequence is complementary to the CRISPR repeats. Complementary means it's base paired, which is kind of unusual. And it's also kind of strange how nobody noticed that before, it seems to me. But um, it turns out that this track RNA is essential for CRISPR function also. And then the sickness lab, the guy I mentioned recently, showed that uh, track RNA, uh, in fact, uh, this was in that paper. It is involved in processing the CRISPR RNA as well as in cleaving the DNA using Cas9 complex. So you need both of these RNA molecules for this CRISPR Cas system to work in E. coli. Right. So this was uh, where we were in 2012. And uh, then um, there's this lady called Jennifer Dodna, who's an RNA expert. And I've put up this slide partly because if you go back and read that Lander article, 
he kind of suddenly throws Donna into the picture as if, you know, she came out of, he does say she's not an expert, but he doesn't say, you know, what work she had done in CRISPR before. In fact, she had done quite a lot of work in CRISPR from the point of view of the endonuclease and endoriboneucleases involved in it, the things that cut the um, DNA RNA. And she was also kind of an expert on uh, another RNA mechanism that was very big at that time, uh, microRNA and RNAi, which basically is a way uh, many organisms have to um, regulate the expression of genes by um, targeting the RNA transcripts of genes. So it's a very similar mechanism where you have a small RNA molecule that combines with a protein complex, uh, which then targets a specific RNA molecule and degrades it. Um, so she had that kind of experience and she had been looking at how all these protein components work in uh, the CRISPR-Cas system. Um, so in 2011, she and Emmanuel Charpentier, who had discovered track RNA, met. And I think Charpentier was giving a talk and Donna attended it and they talked after that and they decided to work together. And they put together, uh, so this is the 2012 paper. So what they've managed to do is in vitro, meaning outside of a living cell, they put together a complete programmable system that could make a targeted cut in DNA they used recombinant Cas9 from uh, staph pyogenes expressed in E. coli, meaning you take the uh, DNA from staph pyogenes and express the same gene in E. coli. And they used uh, CRISPR RNA and TRAC RNA transcribed in vitro. So it did not come from a bacterial gene. Um, they, it, they did this in a petri dish. And they showed that this combination of this CRISPR RNA, TRAC RNA and Cas9 cut DNA in vitro specifically uh, you could program the CRISPR RNA to cut specific DNA by just changing the spacer sequence. Uh, the two nuclease domains of Cas9 cut opposite strands. And uh, they finally showed that you could fuse the CRISPR RNA and the track RNA into a single molecule, which they call single guide RNA, sgRNA. And this still works. So you don't need two separate RNA molecules. You can get, away, get by with one molecule that contains both pieces. And the result is a complete in vitro system for cutting DNA at any desired location. So given the background of what I was saying, this is a much more specific system than talons and zinc finger nucleases. You can basically, instead of engineering a protein to recognize the sequence, you can just put in the DNA of your choice. You can put the RNA version of that as a spacer and it works. Um, so that's fantastic. and. Uh, that's why they got the Nobel Prize this year. Uh, of course, the story doesn't end there, but it's unusual that a work done in 20, published in 2012, already gets the Nobel Prize in 2020, right? In fact, they got prizes starting 2015. But, uh, I'm, and so this is basically kind of how the whole setup works. So this is the double-stranded DNA that you're targeting. It could be in their system, it was a Petri dish, um, but it could be in a living cell. This is the guide RNA or the single guide RNA that um, we talked about. Um, and this is the part that you want to target. And the spacer basically is chosen to be complementary to your target. And this is the PAM uh, motif that I mentioned. And it uh, the cast time cleaves your target precisely uh, a little bit upstream of your PAM motif. Um, so that's kind of, uh, well, so the PAM is really in the RNA, but uh, yeah. So the funny thing is that uh, Virginia Sixness in Lithuania actually was working on the same thing. And he published a paper, uh, as I said, it was published on September 4th. It contained almost all the same results, except that he did not have the single guide RNA uh, concept. But otherwise, he too and his group had achieved cutting an arbitrary DNA in a Petri dish using this CRISPR-Cas9 system. So you can see the history of it. He submitted to Cell on April 26th and they rejected it without review. Um, he submitted on May 21st to PNAS and they took uh, something like four months to review and so on and they finally published on September 4th. Meanwhile, Darna and Sharpentier submitted to Science on June 8th and they got published within three weeks or so. Um, 
um, online. So um, the lesson is put it on bio archive when you have good work. In those days, there was no bio archive. There was, of course, archive, but it was not used by biologists. Um, and uh, this kind of thing is a good reason why one should not wait for journals to publish your work. Uh, if you're confident in it, just put it out there on the archive or bio archive, whatever it is. So um, it is a good question. Shouldn't success also be recognized as a co-inventor of the system? And uh, he was recognized by the people who get the Kavli Prize in 2018, but not by the Breakthrough Prize people and not by the Nobel Committee. Um, so uh, though he did not predict the single guide RNA thing, which turns out to be practically important, um, he did do a lot of the other things independently of them. Right, so that's not the um, end of the controversy in this story. Uh, there is no question, I think, that uh, Nasha Pintia were first, uh, apart from sickness, but there were many other groups that were working on this. If they had not done it, perhaps somebody else would have. And one of those others might have been Zhang, who in fact demonstrated uh, crispr cas in living mammal cells in October 2012, which is just a few months later. And uh, George Church and others also uh, published similar papers around that time. And in terms of practical importance, this is what biologists really want to do, of course. But uh, in terms of uh, conceptual uh, advances, uh, the question is, was this really such a big discovery? And uh, But it was, of course, immensely um, practically important. And people uh, were able to cut at two sites. So I mentioned that if you cut a double-stranded DNA at one site, then the homologous recombination might cause you to knock out a gene. Or it might or might not. But you could cut it at two sites and remove an entire piece of DNA. And then you are more likely to uh, recombine this piece with this piece and completely lose the one in the middle. So from then on, thousands of papers have come out to this day. Um, so it is not, by the way, just about editing genomes, but it is also a very sensitive probe of um, identifying specific DNA elements. Um, so we'll come to that. Um, there is a patent controversy here. So um, the who should really deserve um, so credit in terms of prizes are mostly going to Dr. Nasha Pintier. But um, there is this idea that if you discover a technology, you should patent it so that others have to pay you to use it. So Berkeley filed for a patent in 2012. Broad Institute also filed for a patent in 2012. Broad Institute received the patent. Um, USPTO then checked whether you know it is uh, there is some interference with Berkeley's claim. Then they decided there is no interference. Uh, but then you see, uh, you know, Sir California got the EU patents, and then uh, they also got the US patent on the guide RNA. And uh, there's much more. Uh, so it's an ongoing story. The patent fight is still going on. So, for example, I think just this month there was some ruling against uh, Broad Institute on uh, EU patent claim. Uh, so my view basically is that all these discoveries, as I hope I've conveyed, were built on previous discoveries. And uh, patenting it is really not a good uh, um, gesture for science. Um, you can't, you shouldn't be claiming rights on one discovery when you could not have made it without so many others before you. Um, so, <clears throat> but uh, uh, it has been broad issue that has been particularly aggressive about the patent issue, especially in the US and that has perhaps cost them a certain amount of sympathy. And uh, there are allegations that Lander's article in Cell that I mentioned is kind of downplaying uh, Dr. Nazan Sharpentier's work because he wanted to boost Zhang. In fact, it devotes an entire page to Zhang's work after dismissing Dr. in a paragraph or so. And so that also kicked up a huge fuss. Uh, of the, so, but I won't uh, get into that in this talk, though I had some intention of doing that earlier. Um, as I was saying, you could think of biosensing, and so this work came out from IGIB Delhi recently. Um, it is something that they call, uh, okay, I left out the acronym, but okay, the slide is gone again. I'm sorry about that, I don't know what's happening here. 
um, can you still see me? I think uh, what happened is Zoom has crashed. Um, we can we can see your. Uh, we can see. We can see. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. I've I've lost my Zoom window, but uh, okay, good. So I'll continue. Um, okay, so uh, this is the uh, Barkov article, and uh, what they uh, call it is, uh, which I think Satyajit Ray three fans might recognize. Um, it stands for FNCAST9 based something detection of, I forget what it stands for, but uh, basically what they're using is CRISPR-Cas9 technology not to break DNA, but simply to detect it because it's a very sensitive way to uh, detect uh, any DNA that you like, right? And then after that, you might want to break it, but supposing you don't want to break it. They're saying they can detect the viral genome very quickly using this technology. Okay, so I'll end with the ethical concerns. I think it's almost five o'clock anyway. Um, there have been a lot of concerns about, can you, you can essentially kind of edit anything with this very specifically, and uh, but um, it's easy to play God and we still don't know how common off-target edits are. It's much better than zinc fecal nucleases and so on, but can we really be sure that it's editing only the gene you want and nothing else? Can you really be sure that editing that gene does not cause other effects in your organism? So in 2015, this paper was there in science with authors like uh, many other people we mentioned, Dana Carroll was the zinc finger nucleus guy and uh, George Church is an author, Dobna is an author and uh, various other familiar names. They argued for a temporary moratorium on uh, germline modification. So if you are able to edit um, germ cells, then essentially those edits will go into your entire organism and be passed on to your progeny. And uh, so that's like a permanent edit. And there were worries about various things uh, from uh, is, uh, do we really know how safe it is to the possibility of eugenics and designer babies and so on. So instead of rushing into it, um, they argued for a moratorium. And uh, despite this call in, I think, 2018, the Chinese scientist declared that he had um, edited a pair of twins uh, born in China to have a mutated gene that made them supposedly more resistant to HIV. And I'm not sure what was the big pressing need to do this as opposed to taking precautions as, a, as an adult, but... Um, and what is the consequence of mutating this gene. But this guy seems to have thought that this is the ethical thing to do, but he ran afoul of China's authorities also, and I think he was sanctioned for it, but it also caused a lot of alarm internationally. Um, so 2019, uh, there was another call for a moratorium. I'm sorry, the font is a bit small, but this also contains many of the familiar names, Lander, Zhang, Charpentier. Um, the funny thing to me, is the set of names in this letter is disjoint from the set of names in the other letter. And apparently some of the signatories, including Darna from the other letter, thought that a moratorium will no longer work, but everyone agrees that um, some uh, every national science council should evolve guidelines on responsible CRISPR research, especially for heritable genome editing and germline modification and so on. And in general, any intervention on humans already has to go through various uh, approval levels. Um, those should not be weakened, but uh, they feel that extra caution is required for this case. Um, so again, this is kind of a fast evolving field, but uh, I'm not sure of uh, aware of any other rogue scientists recently who have tried to um, do this kind of edit subsequently. So um, yeah, I'll end with the summary here. So it is a revolutionary technology whose potential has barely been scratched. And uh, uh, within 20, uh, within eight years of uh, Dabna Shapentia's paper, it's basically everywhere in biology. Um, yeah, among things it has done is it has enabled animal models of human diseases. So supposing you know that a particular defective gene causes a particular disease in humans, 
uh, what you can do now is uh, put a similarly defective gene in mouse very easily and uh, grow mice which have just that defect. It could have been done earlier, but much more laboriously. Um, the hope is that the reverse can also be done, but as I said, that requires a lot more caution um, to edit a human gene to cure a disease. Um, in basic molecular biology practice, it has made many things possible, but also as a basic research topic, uh, we've already seen a sort of variety of CRISPR systems in the wild um, across many different prokaryotes. And they're still looking at what other kinds of uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas are out there, um, how you can improve it. So for example, the Cas9 used by the ISGIB group is a particular Cas9 that I think match their needs for uh, some reason. I, I, I think that CRISPR system is unusually specific to DNA, to binding DNA and something. Um, so that kind of work is out ongoing. There are some who suggest that the whole purpose of CRISPR-Cas9 might not be immunity. That might be a side effect because it is a lot of work to achieve this purpose. And it's not clear how it confers. I mean, if it already exists, then it confers immunity. But how does the bacteria evolve it to get immunity against a particular phage, that part is not clear. So there are suggestions that maybe that's not what it's about. Uh, there is some other purpose behind it. And uh, of course, there are these ethical concerns and so on. Um, yeah, so with that, I'll thank you and uh, any questions out there. Thanks. Um, okay. uh, let's thank uh, Rahul for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, you can unmute your mics and uh, give him a big hand. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, sir. So there were a couple of questions on the chat uh, by Roni and uh, uh, Baskaran. So maybe you can um, uh, just uh, unmute your mics and ask Rahul your questions. So uh, can I ask a question, Baskaran? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Um, Rahul, it was a nice talk. I, I don't claim that I understand everything, but it's fascinating. Uh, my question is about this uh, role of physicists, because I remember in earlier days, John Hopfield came up with the idea of kinetic proofreading mm -hmm. in the context of uh, DNA editing. Uh, yeah. So, in fact, apparently he was inspired by some ideas from his supervisor, Overhauser. Mm -hmm on you know, some principles that we use. So are there role for physicists in this game in terms of modeling and in terms of providing new methods? Maybe um, just... I'm not sure. So there is a role for physicists in studying the uh, kinetics of uh, um, DNA protein interactions generally. And uh, so there may be some such role, but I can't. Uh, I mean, perhaps somebody like uh, our colleague Vani, who does uh, molecular modeling quite heavily, might have something to say on that. Um, I'm not aware, but you know, it is interesting that they got the Nobel Prize in chemistry and not in. Uh, so there is no Nobel in biology. There is either chemistry or there is physiology and medicine, but in practice, that usually means there are two Nobels for chemistry. So I have seen jokes that the, the physics novel also should be given to biology one day, and maybe that will happen. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there's another question by Roni. Uh, wants to know what is the ballpark sequence length of a ZFN and a tail end? Uh, um, you mean just the, the zinc uh, protein sequence length in amino acids? Um, it is... Uh, I think each talon, each uh, each component is about, I think, 30 amino acids, and you need several. So um, in both cases, it's hundreds of amino acids. Uh, but I'm not very sure exactly how many. Uh, any, any other questions? Anyone else want to ask? So I had a question about this, uh, this Faluda thing that uh, you mentioned. So yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I vaguely remember reading that it, there were some plans to have a COVID-19 detection kit based on um, based on this. So I don't know if, if it's is yes. it the same thing. 
it is the same thing yes it is for covid i mean they are uh, in the process of rolling it out for covid 19 i think it has got approval from the indian government uh uh-huh. i see so in practice they would sort of just pull uh, whatever sample um yes i think it is the same nasal swab but uh-huh. instead of doing an rt pcr that amplifies the dna uh they would use this and you just need a strip where you know you see the uh if it binds then you will see a shift so i i'm not very sure of the details but uh they say it is much faster and cheaper than the pcr test i see okay and uh, another question so in terms of uh, potential uses to you know clinical uses for example so yeah. uh, so you mentioned sickle cell anemia and so on so if uh, if someone is affected with a certain disease because of a defective gene would that i mean how would the treatment actually proceed would they you know if you want to treat a living person uh, you what cell would you inject it into or i mean yeah. do you know what the correct question that's was that's a good question so for certain kinds of cancer for example if you i mean you you can basically target the bone marrow because that generates the blood cells uh, so for leukemia and so on that works um in other cases um doing this kind of edit all over the body is not feasible i don't think so i don't really know the answer in general to that okay uh any other questions um if not maybe we should thank uh, rahul again for this uh, really wonderful overview of Respect. Okay, thank you all. Thanks, Rob.